I'm here with Judge Jeremy Fogel in Monterey, California at the Hyatt Regency Conference Center during the Ninth Judicial Circuit annual meeting and we're participating in the Video Oral History Project for the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society. My name is Leah McGarrigle and today is July 14th, a Bastille Day, 2014. So thank you very much for joining us, That's Judge. It's a pleasure. We'd like to start in the, in the short time that we have, because this is a more on the shorter side, our interview today, uh, asking you about your decision to become a lawyer and how that came about. Well, um, it, was a, it was not a straight line by any means. Uh, I, I, my father was a lawyer, so I certainly had a, um, a model in my family of someone who had been a lawyer, who was somebody I respected a lot as a lawyer. But my initial interests were um, in other areas. I uh, majored in religious studies. I was pretty sure at the time that, that I would go into academia and, and spend my time studying about that and, and writing about it and devoting my life to it. And I think that there was a point in time where it it's struck me that it was, it was a little bit more isolated than I wanted to be that the, the things I was studying and thinking about were very important to me, and they still are, but um, it just seemed a little bit too removed that the, the idea of an academic life didn't quite, um, when I thought about what I like to do, what I'm good at, what I enjoy, uh, didn't quite line up. And um, I did have the sense that the law was a very large tent, if you will. There's a lot of different things you can do as a lawyer, and going to law school left a lot of opportunities open so, so that's why I did it. it was but it was not a it wasn't clear right up until the end that that's what I was going to do in terms of some of the things that you just mentioned what you like to do and and what you were good at how would you describe what some of those things were at that point well I mean we're in art probably I, I think I've always been um, a good um, listener I've been a good problem solver at least I try to be and um, I'm sort of able to get in the middle of disputes where, where people on both sides feel very strongly and um, I can understand where both of them are coming from and, and help them hear each other better and not, not get entangled in what's going on with them. And that's something I learned about myself pretty early um, and I think I'm a lot better at it now than I was then, um, but it's, it's something that it's almost a, a more of a temperament than it is anything else. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was attracted to um, situations where I could help people solve problems. And I think that's one of the things that lawyers can do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have sort of the image of lawyers as gladiators and um, uh, take no prisoners. And you know, that's, that's, a, that's one very, um, I think, superficial description of what lawyers are because while there are lawyers who are like that, I mean, there are many lawyers who aren't like that, and lawyers, I think, play a lot of different roles. And I was always drawn to the role of lawyer as problem solver, and so the, the um, kinds of law that I was involved in, and, and eventually the decision to pursue a judgeship, I think all go back to this idea of you know, trying to help people get their interests heard and trying to get to, to some resolution. This isn't a specific question, but since you were a religious studies major, it, it makes me wonder, were there particular, is there a connection between the religious studies and the, the way the law maybe touches on some of the same I similar answer, topics? That's an excellent question, and I think, I think there is a connection. Uh, I think that religions, um, pretty much across the board, try to help people find a way to live how to order their lives and how to deal with the, the challenges that life throws at us and, and, and figure out a, a, a way of dealing with things in a, in a moral and ethical way. And, and I think the law um, is in, in part intended to serve the same purpose, that it mm -hmm. it's helps people um, w when they have differences, um, uh, instead of fighting about them, they, they, they have rules that they can look at and they can have um, ethical standards they can try to live up to. Um, obviously the law is a lot more complex than that and religion is a lot more complex than that, mm -hmm. but, they, but they do have that thing in common. Mm -hmm. And um, I've said this a lot in, in talks I've given in my current job that the, um, since we're in a society that's um, 
nominally secular. Is you, you don't have a society where there's a state religion or you have a dominant uh, denomination or anything like that. You have lots of different beliefs among lots of different peoples and a lot of different communities. That the one thing that everybody more or less accepts as, as governing their conduct is the law. So the law is a, a more uh, it's a more important piece in a society like ours in the United States than it might be in some place where, where religion was, was more central. And um, because of that, the law kind of takes on that, that role of being the place where people go for guidance in, in, in situations where, where, uh, where they're having trouble. And, and so I think lawyers and judges both have roles to play in a system like that where they are it's more than just a job. You really are a, a custodian, in a way, of the of the whole idea of the rule of law as a as a way of a way of living. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that, there is there is a straight line for me between one and the other. Well, we'll come back to that yeah, a little bit. Yeah. We talk about your current job, and it's certainly a a big topic. It would be great to explore more in depth as well. And. Um, Tell us a little bit about your work following law school. Well, um, I moved from uh, law school to directly to San Jose, California, where I've spent my entire professional career until, until the last three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the first several years, I pretty much just did, a, I guess the best way to characterize it is a storefront law practice. I was interested in helping people mm -hmm. who didn't have access to the courts uh, get access to the courts. I, worked with several other like-minded people. Um, we primarily represented uh, people who didn't have a lot of money. Um, and we did everything. We did civil work. We did criminal work. Uh, um, I had a particular interest in um, mental health. Um, and I had pursued that to some extent when I was in law school. And um, in 1978, there was a uh, grant program that the American Bar Association started to provide uh, better legal services to people with mental disabilities and mental illness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I applied for one of the grants, um, actually through the, the County Bar Association, which had a uh, public interest um, uh, organization within it, and, and we got the grant. Um, and so I left my private practice to become uh, the person in charge of, of running that uh, grant program. And I was able to get some additional funding from some other sources, from some federal jobs programs, and uh, some money from the state of California, and some money from the county of Santa Clara, and started a legal services program for people with mental disabilities. That was actually the main thing I did in my prejudicial career, was, was getting that up and running. Mm -hmm. um, and um, did that for four years. And uh, the program, I'm very proud to say, is still alive and well. Uh, 35 years later, uh, and it's, uh, it, was a, uh, it was really, really interesting to sort of figuring out how to set this thing up and find people to work there. And, and uh, we, we had a real um, profoundly problem-solving model. Our, our goal was not to file lawsuits on behalf of our clients and, and uh, win hollow victories. We really were trying to improve their uh, their living situation, whatever it was, if they needed better medical care, or they needed a better place to live, or they needed a job, um, or they were dealing with discrimination in one of those areas, or they weren't getting their benefits. That our, our whole uh, approach was what what are the issues that this person has that need to be addressed, and how how can the law help? And and a lot of our clients either couldn't communicate at all, or they communicated in very uh, difficult to deal with ways. They were um, psychotic or they were uh, um, challenged in some developmental way or they had, they had various problems with communication. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we had to do was figure out how to identify what their actual problem was and develop a relationship with them where we could develop trust and understanding and then figure out how to use the legal system to, to um, uh, improve the situation they were in. So it was very practical, very mm -hmm. pragmatic, and I think I, I give it a tremendous amount of credit for making me a better listener and a better problem solver because they were really challenging folks to work with. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they really pushed the envelope of what I could handle. 
Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that's true for all of my colleagues then and, then and now uh, who have worked there over the time that the agencies existed. What is the name of that it's, agency It's called the Mental today? Health Advocacy Project. Okay. It's, it's, it's located in San Jose. And that kind of, not exactly holistic, but it was, you know, very full spectrum program. Uh, at the time you started it, there was more funding available, I imagine, than there is today. So that's quite a tribute that it continues yeah, today. Yeah, we were able to get a couple of um, uh, sponsors who were, who were not going to go away. I mean, because it's true, there were mm -hmm. funds available then that uh, certainly haven't been available for a long time. But um, the, the county really stepped up and uh, they had a legal obligation to um, provide uh, an advocacy or an advocate at least for the people in the county's mental hospitals and they made a, a permanent uh, commitment to the program and that was always the core uh, the core funding source and then mm -hmm. there was some additional money that came from the Bar Association and, and uh, eventually the, the uh, Silicon Valley Law Foundation which is the parent organization mm -hmm. Um, you know, as Silicon Valley developed, um, then you started having some of the major firms contributing money and you know, it became a lot more, more viable. Oh, good. Good yeah. to hear. You mentioned your father was a lawyer and, and so you grew up, you know, exposed to the law. Um, but how did your decision to become a judge come about or, or that change well, come about? Um, it really was a matter of opportunity mm -hmm. uh, and uh, realizing that even though the kind of advocacy I was doing was less adversarial than uh, some forms of advocacy, there still was an adversarial aspect to it, that it's still, there were ethical obligations I had that, that would require me to take positions I didn't really fully believe in. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I think I'd also, I think the other thing that was a major influence was when I did go to court with my clients, um, which was not often, but it was often enough, I actually had a fair bit of courtroom experience. I realized for someone with this brief and actual legal career as I had, mm -hmm. that I saw some judges treat my clients very poorly. Mm -hmm. And I saw other judges treat my clients very well. You know, I saw a, a really large uh, range of judicial behavior. And I think there was something about, I mean, I really then and now admire the judges who, who were thoughtful and compassionate and dignified. And, but the ones who really were not, you know, who, who were hard on my clients, who treated them badly, despite the fact that their condition was not something they had any control over, um, and treated other people badly, and yelled at people and that kind of thing. I, I think I saw in there, I said, you know, I can do better than that. That, that, that it's not good that that happens. And it sort of it's back to the, the uh, question you asked me earlier about the, the law-religion connection, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that judges are important, you know, that, that, that as far as the public is concerned, the people who have cases, uh, they expect a judge to have dignity and to, to have, to be not, if not, if not kind, at least wise, and to be, to be thoughtful and to be interested and, and, and to be respectful, and and when judges don't act like that, it, it kind of it, it, it hurts all of us in some way. Mm -hmm. And and so, I think that kind of inspired me. And it's not, it's, it's funny; it was a negative example, but it inspired me. And you know, I think I think if I ever get the chance to be a judge, I think that's something that might line up pretty well with my with my skill set. And um, then I had an opportunity. Uh, the, the, the governor at the time was appointing younger. Uh, judicial candidates and my my um, uh, program had gotten some national press the, the mental health program had mm -hmm. and so I was somebody who I guess was a, a viable candidate despite the fact that I was young and mm -hmm. and uh, you know it happened so mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was just a very good uh, very good thing I feel very lucky and I think that's one of the things that that I felt throughout my career that there's there's so many people who would make good judges who don't get to be judges because, you know, they're the wrong political party or they don't have the right opportunity at the right time or whatever it is. They don't know the right people. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate um, kind of at every stage, every uh, position I've gotten that I have had people who helped me and, and people who thought I would do a good job and 
and that there was an opportunity. So. Well, clearly, you, before you went on the bench, you had thought deeply about what about that role. But what was that transition like, or was that a transition? Well, it was a transition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I started in the what is a court that doesn't even exist anymore. It was the municipal court mm -hmm. uh, in in 1998 that became unified. So California now is, is unified trial courts. So so now the what was then the Muni Court became part of the Superior Court. Uh, but, but I was on what was then the municipal court for the first five years of my career, and it's a court that uh, does almost exclusively criminal work. I mean, there is, there is some civil work they do, mostly landlord tenant and, and debt collection kinds of cases, but, but, the, but the primary thing they do is, is criminal. They do, do uh, misdemeanor cases and then all of the preliminary proceedings and felony cases. And so I was really exposed to the, you know, it's like you see in some of the TV shows almost, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the night court kind of uh, um, mash unit uh, triage of, of hundreds or thousands of cases and people coming in and, and uh, you know, almost all of them getting, getting dealt out uh, pretty quickly. But, but you really learn, in, in, or I learned in that context, you know, how to deal with a lot of people with big calendars, um, um, with the political um, environment with, with deputy district attorneys and defenders and, and, and just the whole courthouse scene that um, uh, you don't see so much as you go up the ladder. You certainly don't see it that much in the, in, in the federal courts, but it's part and parcel of what happens in the state courts and particularly in what was then the Muni Court. Um, and, and I had no experience with that other than the, the few times I'd appeared on behalf of a client. And so I had to learn a lot very quickly. I had to learn a lot about people, a lot about who the people were I was dealing with, who I could trust, who I couldn't trust. Um, you know, what, what you, know, you, you can't, in a, in a situation like that, uh, get, get too focused on any one detail, because if you do, you'll get way behind. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have to learn how to think fast. Mm -hmm. and act fast and make quick decisions and some mm -hmm. of your decisions are going to be wrong and it has to be okay. You know, if you're a, if you're a, as I always describe myself, you're a recovering perfectionist, you know, that, that it's, it's sort of a long way from, you know, from law school to the reality of, of what goes on in, 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 a, in a situation like that. So it was, there was a tremendous transition. The other thing that was, that was a big uh, change is I was, I was very young compared to my colleagues. Now that, changed relatively quickly. Within a couple years after I got on the court, there were a number of other people who were about the same age as I was who, who joined, so that became less of an issue. But, mm -hmm. but I think the, the uh, age gap was between me and my next youngest colleague when I started was 16 years. You know, that's just a big, people would look at me and then they would say, where's the judge? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're obviously the clerk. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so there were those kinds of um, experiences for, for a fair bit that I had to, had to face as well. It's almost a generation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was it was mm -hmm. it was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I was really fortunate in that I had an absolutely terrific courtroom clerk, uh, and we're still we're still in touch from time to time. She just was extremely capable. She knew everybody. You know, she knew where the where the bodies were buried. She was very loyal to me and and helped me out enormously. And I think that uh, would have been very different if if I hadn't had someone like that to work with. Well, in terms of transitions, how did your appointment to the federal bench come about? Well, that's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of things, it was not something that I had even thought about. Um, I had been on the state court by, by then for almost 16 years um, and um, was doing fine. I was doing uh, uh, managing, I was one of, the, one of the team leaders in the civil division, so I was managing couple thousand cases and we were getting a lot of, um, um, starting to get a lot of cases from Silicon Valley that were pretty interesting trade secret cases and securities cases and other things that were, 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 were challenging. Um, and I wasn't sure you know, how long I'd want to do that, but, but it was, I was just kind of going along. And, and then um, there was uh, a situation where one of my, one of a, the former judges in our court uh, resigned as a result of a, a disposition of a criminal case. And, and there was a 
vacancy and the um, person who was nominated, or not nominated, but was recommended initially to take that vacancy uh, during the course of his vet uh, by the Department of Justice developed an, an ethical issue and so he had to withdraw. And so at that point the senator who ultimately recommended me was, was looking around for somebody who didn't have any, any ethical baggage and who, who had a, actually had a strong reputation in that area. And, and again, so much of this you just sort of wonder, well, you know, maybe things are just meant to be, but I had been the chair of the Ethics Committee for the California Judges Association for a number of years and mm -hmm. been an area where I'd done a lot of work. And, and I think it was, it was being the right person at the right time that, that, that it was, I was able to uh, come in and I didn't have any of those kinds of, of issues. Um, the other thing I always think about in that appointment was that um, the, the Senate, very much like it is today, was, was at odds uh, politically. It was in reverse. The Republicans controlled the Senate and there was a Democratic president. And uh, the uh, get, getting anybody through the committee was, was a challenge at the time that I got nominated. And I think there was a, a uh, search on for some people who would have bipartisan support. And, and I did, and, and it was just something that, that helped me a lot. And again, I, and I think back, well, how did that happen? And it was people I had known from my work with the California Judges Association and the ethics work, and um, knew a lot of people who, and you, you get to know people and you find things in common. And I had um, um, people who were supporting me who I shared this interest in religion with, uh, things like that, and mm -hmm. that, that helped with, with um, um, getting support from them to call senators they knew and things like that. So the whole process was fascinating, but uh, I, I think mostly it was because when the vacancy occurred they were looking for someone with the, the kind of background I had. I could take each one of yeah, those yeah. Uh, strands and pull it apart, um, not pull it apart, but uh, ask you more questions in depth, but in the time we have for today I wanted to ask you to touch on your role and and that, in turn, um, goes back to some of these earlier topics we've, we've had time to, to just ask you about today. So the, what the role I have now is the director of the Federal Judicial Center. Um, and that is for all but one of the ten directors has been an Article III judge. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty much uh, the rule that the director is a, a judge. Um, and I'm still a judge. I don't. I don't lose my status as a result of taking this job. It's more like being on on extended leave. But the um, job is entirely different. It's. It's. Uh, I'm, I'm not hearing cases. Um, and um, the two principal things that we do are education for the entire federal judicial branch, not just the the judges, but also the court administrators and the other people who staff the courts, and um, the other is policy research. So if the um, judicial conference, which is the governing body of the courts, wants to um, study a particular kind of case management or uh, the adoption of a particular kind of policy or uh, a set of rules, uh, all the different rules, sort of federal rules of procedure that are, that are put out, uh, we have a role to play uh, in providing uh, unbiased research uh, in investigating those kinds of issues or concerns. So those are the two main things that we do. And um, it's, it's so funny in a, in a way because, you know, way back when, when I decided to be a lawyer, I, I didn't want to be an academic because I didn't want to go through the, the, the strictures of, a, of an academic life. And I am very much an academic now. Mm -hmm. but, but it's an applied academic. Uh, and I don't have to struggle for tenure and I don't have to publish X number of articles or books. It's, it's more really an opportunity to think about the, what the needs are of the whole institution, what, what a judge's need in the way of education, what, how can we do our research in a way that is above reproach and, and, and actually helps the people who are making the policy decisions make good decisions or at least informed decisions. So. Um, you know, there's a big, it's a, it's a big responsibility, but it's also one that uh, is, is very interesting and very enjoyable. I have just a superb uh, professional staff to work with. 
uh, one of the things I always uh, like to tell people about the FJC is that the average amount of time that the, the average employee has been there is 14 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that means people stay there a long time. And if you go into the research division, the average tenure is 22 years. Mm -hmm. So these are folks who really have dedicated their lives or a large part of their lives to this work. And it's, there's a real uh, sense of, of commitment. Um, nobody's there because they're getting paid a lot. Nobody's there because they're, they're getting, you know, some sort of special bonus points or anything like that. They're there because they really believe in the mission. And it's, it's fun working somewhere where, where there is a mission like this one and, and people really believe in it. It has that teaching component that an academic career uh, has as well. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and both, both teaching and designing mm -hmm. um, uh, programs. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do do some teaching. I like teaching and want to continue to teach. So, so I do uh, serve as a faculty member in a number of programs. But the, the part that I haven't really had a chance to do before is, is the, the development of new, um, new material, new curricula. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, I'm particularly interested in is how judges think. You know, we know we know what we're supposed to do. We you know we're supposed to study the law and apply the law and make the correct decision. But but you know there are all these peripheral issues like like fairness and, and accuracy and and uh, um, treating people with respect and all these these other things which are also very important parts of being a judge. And how do you develop those skills? How do, you, how do you train your mind so that you don't rush to judgment and you, you actually think as accurately as a, any fallible human being can about what it is you're deciding? And How do you deal with stress? How do you deal with um, the things that might knock you off your game so you would not be able to decide a case fairly or you might treat somebody badly? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of more the, the, the whole process of, of judging how we do our jobs, in addition to what the job is, that uh, I'm trying to add some material about. And, and that's really been, uh, it's been challenging because you, you want to do it in a way that doesn't scare people. You want to do it in a way that people accept as, well, this just helps me get where I'm already going. And this, this affirms what I, who I am and what I'm trying to do. And, and so that's been, a, been a, a, a good challenge, but it's been a challenge. And the other thing that's been a big change for me is just it, it's a national constituency. And the circuits are very different from each other. And the different parts of the country are very different from each other. And it's been really fascinating for me to, you know, I'll spend time here in the Ninth Circuit and we have a sort of a way of, of life here. And, and even though people might disagree fairly profoundly about stuff, there's still a, a culture that characterizes our circuit. That, that is, is quite different, say, from the culture in the Fifth Circuit or the Fourth Circuit or the Sixth Circuit. And that, that people just, uh, in different parts of the country, grow up differently. There's different things that are going on in their communities, and um, they have different history. And so it's been a real interesting thing for me to see those differences and figure out what's local, what's universal. You know, what can you, what can you do that really works on a national level, and what and what doesn't. That's fascinating. Yeah. And I understand from what you said just before we started that uh, this, the role and, and the mission of the organization is to work with new judges as well as judges who've been in their, in well, their and, professions and, and, for a long time. That's right. In mm -hmm. fact, the, the, the um, most widely attended programs that we have are the new judge programs. We get um, 90, 95 percent of the newly appointed judges come to our orientation programs. Mm -hmm. And then there's a drop off after that, after people go to that, then because it's all voluntary, we don't have any mandatory judicial education. So mm -hmm. so the the turn the percentages of people who might go to programs later on as continuing education programs is is lower. I mean it's in the sixty to seventy percent range. But but uh, the new judge orientation is really pretty critical because when people are coming in, uh, they most of them have never been judges before. And there's a difference between the people who come from the state courts to the federal courts and people who are coming out of practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones who are coming out of practice really have a lot to learn because in addition to learning the federal law and the federal procedure and the ways that the federal courts are different from the state courts, they also have to learn all of the personal stuff 
about being a judge, uh, at least for the state judges, and this was certainly my experience, some of the things I learned in baby judge school were things I already knew, because you know you have to have some ability to manage a calendar, and you have to be able to uh, know what kinds of social relations you can and can't have, and you, 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 there are things that are common to judges regardless of what level they're at or what system they're in, mm -hmm. but there, if for the people who come into the uh, judiciary from somewhere else, it's, it's a lot of cold water, um, you know, getting thrown on you, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big change. Not to say people don't like it, because I think people really do, but, but there's a lot of ways your life changes that it just takes a while for people to absorb. And so when you're um, teaching a baby judge class, I mean, a lot of it is just kind of really giving people a chance to talk and ask questions and, you know, no, no question is too dumb, you know, and it's, it's, it's just a, it's, it's really helping people get comfortable with the idea that they're in this, in this position. Well, I would really like to know more about a lot of the things that you talked about in, in this role in Washington and hopefully we can we can follow sure. up at a later date or there are, there are things that are written that I can look sure. at and and this whole maybe not quite psychology but this whole way to approach individuals about some of the larger themes that come up and that are absolutely critical to their work. I think it's uh, it's um you, this is one of the things that I have always felt that I've been privileged to do is I think I have this, this perspective of, uh, that I got from my earlier work and, and the things I was interested in earlier in my life of sort of thinking about what people really care about in the end, the end of the day and, and sort of adding that to the law and the judicial profession that, that we don't want to ever be too narrow. Um, that there's a, there's a fundamental um, set of rules and, and, and thought process, a way of thinking we have to get right. I mean, that's, that's a necessary part of being a good judge, I think, is you, you have to be able to understand and interpret the law and do good legal reasoning and, and apply the facts to the law and all that kind of thing. But, but um, I think the, the human dimension of it is really worth exploring, and it, it is part of it is part of being a judge, not, be, not just because judges are people, mm -hmm. uh, but because I think the, the cultural expectations for the rule of law and for judges within the rule of law, there is an expectation that judges will be thoughtful people, mm -hmm. that they will be mindful people. You know, and I think that's kind of the, 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 the big overarching goal I have as long as I am in the position that I'm in. We'll all follow more yeah. more the work that's happening in in Washington that you're that you're doing. And just before we wrap up, is there something that you would like to add that we haven't had a chance to talk about in the time we have today? O only that, and I may have said it a couple times, but it it really is the most important thing that mm -hmm. I have to say, and that is that I, I'm just so grateful that in in my life I've had these opportunities. Um, I mean, a lot of things had to break right, and um, I mean, I wake up in the morning and I just say, wow, you know, this really worked out pretty well, um, and it's worked out well for me in my family life as well, but I mean, in, in this area in particular, it's mm -hmm. just a, and, and I'm very, very uh, lucky to have had these opportunities, and I, 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 think, I think most judges, when, when they get right down to it, I think most of us feel that way. Uh, this is not something we were entitled to, it's something that that, that something good that happened to us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Fogel.